afternoon, everyone. Today is Saturday of the 12th week in Ordinary Time. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. Such a nice day, a little humid. Be careful, everyone. Please drink your water. If you're going to go outside or go for a little walk, it's nice. I want to continue with the celebration of Mass from yesterday. So we end it with the sign of peace. And remember I said, you know, when the, when the Second Vatican Council implemented the actual physical handshake, it was, of course, to the gospel text that if your brother has anything against you, go and first reconcile with your brother and then present your gift to the altar. So the actual signing of, or shaking of hands or a sign, uh, the church never said to shake hands. It said, offer each other a sign. Well, I don't know, what, what's your sign? Some people may do this, or some people may do this. I do this. You know, I do this in a little smile. That's my sign of peace. I don't, you know, especially post-pandemic, you know, we're very conscious of that fact, and the archdiocese says, oh, why don't we just you know, calm it down with actually uh, shaking hands. But hey, listen, remember I told you, if you want to shake somebody's hand in your family or if you want to kiss your spouse, that's fine. The archdiocese is just telling priests or deacons, you know, let's, you know, the peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit. And then we just offer each other a sign of peace the way that we want to. But we don't want to make that statement. Why? Because people are like, well, I'm putting my hand out and someone else is not shaking it. So what's all that about? You know, that's so rude, Father. Why isn't she shaking my hand? Well, because she doesn't feel comfortable doing that. So why don't you just like look at people and smile? That's a sign of peace. What is peace? Peace is harmony. So don't cause disharmony by saying, shake my hand, shake my hand. That's disharmony. Peace is a sign of harmony. Just say, hey, peace. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ be with you. That's all. One, two, three, that's it. Boom, 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 over. You don't have to make it a big thing. It's not to be, a, it's never meant to be a big thing anyway. It's meant to be a sign of peace. Peace of Christ be with you. Many people just bow their head and smile. That's a sign of peace. Doesn't mean an actual handshake, bear hug, kiss. They're, all, they're also signs of peace. It doesn't mean that you have to do one of them. You may have a sign that you want to do. That's nice. So the Archdiocese has asked priests and deacons within our parishes and institutions not to make the same let's offer each other a sign of peace because that connotates uh, the physical touch or whatever, even though it really doesn't. But I'm not going to argue the point because it's saying let us offer each other a sign. But we're so trained that the sign is a handshake. So, so I get it. See, I'm not arguing. I get it. I, I get it. So the archdiocese just, just refrain from saying that and just they could give each other whatever sign they want to give is a sign for them to offer to one another. That's all. So anyway, that comes from that scripture passage. So I thought that was it's beautiful. And then after that, we go into the, what is called the fraction rite. Did you ever hear that term? The fraction. You're breaking the host. The one body, many members, see the fractured. Comes from the oneness. And so we begin the litany. Did you know the Lamb of God is a litany? A litany. And it could go on for 10 times lamb of god you take away the sins of the world have mercy on us lamb of god you take away the sins of the world have mercy on us let it could go on and on it's a litany it doesn't have to do two and then grant us peace 
Now, the reason why we do it is because the fraction has already been pre-done, and I'll explain what that means. So you see the host, they're already pre-cut into little circles. I don't have to do it for everybody in the church. Because <laughs> if I did, that means you would be singing the Lamb of God, that litany, until the cows came home, until I had enough breaks for everybody. But because the nuns do this for us, the cloistered nuns, you know, they bake the altar breads, and they already have them pre-punched into little circles. So I don't have to go on and on and on and break and break and break and break and break and break and break. It's already done. So that's why we only do the two parts of the litany and the granite's peace. So Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. And it's done. But I just want to tell you, it's a litany that could go on and on until the whole fraction rate is done. So just to give you an idea about that, okay? The priest places a piece of the, of the host into the chalice. It's called the commingling. Have you ever heard of that term? Commingling. The commingling of the body and blood, the soul and the divinity into the chalice. The commingling of both species together. And then the priest genuflects and then raises up the host and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And then we respond, like the centurion, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Isn't that beautiful? It's all from scripture, all from sacred scripture. The priest consumes the host and then drinks from the chalice. And then he begins the distribution of Holy Communion of everybody around him. And he says, the body of Christ. Now, why do we say the body of Christ? You know this answer. You know this answer. Shall I ask Susan to explain all this to us? You know this answer. Why do we say the body of Christ? Not this is the body of Christ. Because we understand that the Eucharist is not only the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, but it is also the body of Christ contained within the deposit of faith. The deposit of faith, everything that we believe and teach, it is part of the body, the body of Christ. Everything that we believe and teach as revealed by God. So let me pose that question to you. Do you profess and believe all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches as revealed by God? Because when you receive Holy Communion, you're saying amen to that. See, it's, it's, you have to understand the Eucharist in its totality. in its totality, both and, not either or, that it is the body of Christ, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, but it's also everything that the body of Christ teaches and professes to be believed, calling for faith as revealed by God. So if you are excommunicated, you're exiting yourself from communion, right? The communion of faith. You're exiting yourself from the communion of faith of what we profess and believe as revealed 
by God. So those who are Lutheran are excommunicated. They're, they are not part of communion because they're not in communion with us. If they were in communion with us, they wouldn't be Lutheran. So when, to all your friends who say, what's the big deal? You answer that question. So what is the big deal? So if it's not a big deal, then stop going to a Lutheran ecclesial community and start going to the one Catholic church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, if it's not a big deal. I mean, that's what people say, right? What makes the difference? Uh, what ma okay, fine. Well, then stop all this division then. Stop it. Then come to the one church that you, that you broke away from. I'm just answering the question. So if, if it is, no, uh, it's no big deal. Oh, it's, they all believe, they, do we all believe the same? No, we don't. Stop saying that. Stop saying we all believe the same thing. If we did, I would be a Lutheran minister. You're making an insult to me, so stop it. <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want to be a Lutheran minister. I'm a Catholic priest. I don't believe what they believe. That's why I'm not with them. So stop saying it doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, then tell them, come back. Oh, it does matter. Okay, now I see. Does it matter or doesn't it matter? What is it? Uh, what is it? Everyone like says, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I was on you down. Okay, you know, it's okay. It's, uh, really? All right, well then, well then, what was broken? Why don't you have them come and seal it back together again? Because they exited from communion. So do the Methodists. They said, no. We're exiting from communion with you. Communion. To be in union with you. We're no longer in union with you. We're exiting from the communion of faith. We don't believe what you're professing as revealed by God. We're like, beep, 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 leaving by. That's excommunication, leaving communion with you. Well, if it doesn't matter, bring them back. Because I didn't leave them. They left the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So, does it matter? It does. It absolutely does. Because you're talking about two sets of beliefs. All of these beliefs that we believe is revealed by God. And then the beliefs of the Lutheran ecclesial community, the Methodist ecclesial community, the Baptist ecclesial community, the Jehovah Witness ecclesial community, the Episcopalian ecclesial community, all of their beliefs. If it doesn't matter, if it really doesn't matter, well then come on, let's just, let's just come back. So, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't, everyone's saying it doesn't matter, so come on back. Or does it matter? And if it does, and if it does matter, what are the major differences? You'd be surprised how many differences there are. What do they believe about the Eucharist? What do they believe about transubstantiation? 
What do they believe about the Blessed Virgin Mary? What do they believe about papal infallibility and the teaching of Christ when it comes to Peter and his successors? What does it believe about the priesthood? What does it believe about the mass? Oh, so, but people say it doesn't matter. It's we're all it's all the same. Father, I went to a Lutheran church. I said a Lutheran ecclesial community. Oh, Father, I went to a Lutheran ecclesial community, and it's almost the same. You, you're talking about the ritual. Well, yeah. What else is there? <laughs> There's more than just the ritual of a service. They copied from us. In fact, do you know that when we're finished with our text and we revise our text, guess who gets the former text? The Lutherans. Because they say to themselves, why reinvent the wheel? Just take it from the Catholics. So when you go there and you say their service is just like ours, because they took it from us. And the only way I know this is because I have a Lutheran friend who told me it's the fact. Does it matter? Of course it matters. Of course it does. Stop saying it doesn't. Because if it did not matter, then Jesus said, let them be one as we are one father. He prayed for the unity of the church, that it did not scatter. Well, I'm just telling you, because when you're with people at 4th of July and over dinner one night or having drinks and this comes up, what do you say? I don't know. I yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. I'm like, I, I get all excited. I, I'm like, okay, let's talk. Well, it does matter. It does matter. Because it matters in teaching, dogma, doctrine. It matters in the way, of course, that this has been handed on to us from Christ to the apostles to this generation. You know, it does matter. Even the priesthood. What is the priesthood? Remember I told you, even like the, the word church, like what is church? Capital C, small c. But what, how do you define the church? Please don't tell me it's a place where people go to pray. Ah, small c, I'm not talking about small c. No, no, I'm not talking about small c, I'm talking about capital C. Define the church, the church that Christ founded on Peter's confession of faith. That is what I want to talk to you about. How do we define the church? So all these other places are popping up, calling themselves churches. No, no. Jesus did not found 50,000 Churches pop up, pop up, pop. They were founded by people. And they just call themselves church. But see how see how it really takes away from the word. We chop that word up and throw it away. Yeah, it's it doesn't have any meaning. The word church, the word church lost its meaning. Theologically. Theologically. Now, if you want to say small c, small c, yeah, which everyone talks about. That's a church, that's the church, here's a church, there's a church, everyone's a church, church, ba, 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 ba. E -I -E -I -O. here's a church, there's a church, there's a church, ba, ba, e -I -E -I -E -I -O. there's only one church. And it was not old MacDonald, it was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That's the capital, the theological definition. I don't want to hear the 
old McDonald definition of here's a church, there's a church, everywhere's a church, church. I want to hear what is the theological definition of church? Apostolic succession. Jesus says it to Peter. Peter then continues it. When Peter dies, it's then continued. When that person died, the second pope, it continued. When the third pope died, it continued. When the fourth pope died, it continued. Apostolic succession. To this 266 pope, Francis. Give me the theological definition of church. Not the street corner definition of church, that's small c. So we're dealing with apostolic succession. We're dealing about the validity of the sacraments. We're de dealing about the understanding of the priesthood. There's only one priest. That's why when these ecclesial communities have priests, I'm like, they're not priests. They've already broke. So is everything the same? No, not every. See, that's why you be careful. Don't just give in to like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as you have to be nice to everybody. Yeah, well, well, how about, you know, somebody having four wives? He's nice. Just let him do what he has to do. Oh, is that okay? No, I'm saying we could say that about everything. He no bother nobody, Father. He's nice. Good. He's nice, you know why? Because God made him nice. God created the person. Please don't say that either. That's also an insult. It's an insult to people's intelligence. You know, we are, we are good because God looked on creation and said it is good. Period. So these are the things you have you have to learn. Yeah, you have to learn. Because how are you going to take your faith out to the marketplace? In your backyard, at a restaurant, in your living room, when you're when you're talking to your kids, you know, because kids have all the answers. Your kids know everything, I don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they think they know everything, right? So your kids will tell you. When your, when your kids leave the faith, what are you going to tell them then? You know, because they're going to tell you, well, ah, it doesn't matter. God loves us all. And I always like to say, he does love us all, but he calls us to a deeper realization of what we are to do with our life. Okay, if it... God loves us all. Why did he put his son through this? Answer the question. Oh, it doesn't matter. God loves us all. I know. I know he does. So why this? Why couldn't he just say, take two, let's start over. Interesting, right? Exactly. Exactly. Why did our Lord go through this? Obviously, it does matter. Everything matters. We like to justify our behavior by saying, eh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does matter. It does. Everything matters. So, it's important. It's important to know your Catholic faith. Apologetics. Apologetics is allowing us to articulate our faith in situations that we come across, that we need to be a prophetic voice. Remember I told you you're a priest, prophet, and king? So, how are you voicing prophetically the faith.
the faith that was handed down to you from generation to generation, all the way to the time of Christ and the apostles. How are you articulating that? Or are we weakening it? Is it becoming very soupy? I mean, before it was like very strong and hearty, the faith. Everyone knew. There was not a question. There was not a question. Everyone knew the faith. Everyone knew where the church taught on marriage, where the, ta where the church taught on human life, where the church taught on the sacraments, what the church taught on priesthood, what the church said about divorce, what the church said about Mary. It was clear. It was hardy. Now it's like seeping through your fingers. It's like, I don't know. It's up to you. What do you think? No. Well, that is, what do you think? It's not up for you to think about this. It's handed on to us. We all have our opinions. But are we going to argue with what has been given to us from Christ and the apostles to this present day? He's given the church to be the mother, to guide it, to hold it together, to answer the questions. It's important. Remember I told you, people say, is the church necessary for salvation? That's another interesting question. I, we spoke about this before. Is the church necessary for salvation? Yes! <laughs> of course it is. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus says, my church. I will build my church and the gates of the netherworld will not prevail against it. To you I entrust the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you declare loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatsoever you declare bound in on earth shall be bound in heaven. Papal infallibility. Please know your Catholic faith. Back it up through scripture and the constant apostolic tradition of the church. Capital T, not small t, we apostle on Sunday. That's a small t. Apostolic tradition in areas of morals and faith. Capital T. Coming from the apostles. All right. Well, you know me, I get too excited about all these things and I'm going on and telling you about all these things because I need you to understand excommunication, excommunicatione, it's the Latin, excommunicatione, to exit from communion because I no longer believe and profess what the Holy Roman Catholic Church teaches and professes to be revealed by God. I have excommunicated myself. Now, there are formal decrees of that. Don't get me wrong. But we say by the mere fact you did this, you excommunicated yourself. We say ipso facto. You did this. You have chosen to exit from communion. How do you get back confessional? And do you believe now? I know. It's a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about and it's a lot to, to really understand. I'll continue this tomorrow as we talk about communion and how we receive Holy Communion. Have a nice day everybody.